Hello conductors, this week's topic is making your rehearsals most effective by doing less. So we're talking about the five word directive, how you can demonstrate effectively in rehearsal and how you can create a silent rehearsal. So let's talk about first the ideas of efficient and effective rehearsals. So of course you know we have to use our time wisely. If we don't, we're wasting time. Music is time, time is music. We should engage the imagination of our students. They will learn more deeply that way. Pacing increases engagement. When we keep going quickly, we don't allow time for other things to happen in our rehearsal, like going on screensaver. Um, if always offer a how, in terms of corrective measures, then we're empowering our students with a tool that they can use in the future. And with that tool, we can remind them of their student responsibility instead of us as conductors having to do or demonstrate or remind all the time, we can um, remind the students of the tool that we've given them. And then of course, for efficient and effective rehearsals, we should always speak in positives. Instead of don't do, fill in the blank, put a verb on it and do. Okay, so language in rehearsal. Here are a couple of ideas to think about as we explore further in terms of our directives. Okay, so when we get started, we waste a lot of time by trying to explain who is going to do what. Just answer three simple questions. Who, where, and how. Who, sopranos, where, measure seven, how, on solfege, and we go. Okay, who, tenors and basses, where, beginning, how, sing on text, and we go. So you can train yourself to speak in very succinct ways that will save you time in rehearsal. Let's talk about feedback. We always need to give feedback to or else they don't know how they're doing. So that's an important part of our language after we stop the music. So I like to think of feedback as a one word, um, feedback on a spectrum. So the spectrum goes from really not good to that was really excellent. So for example, um, really not good would be nope. <laughs> really excellent would be yes. So some spectrum in the middle would be good or try again or you're on to something or figure out your own ways of, of using succinct one to three word phrases that give some sort of feedback honestly to the students so that when they do the passage again, they know how to um, engage their abilities. Okay, the other thing is to speak in directives rather than commands. I mentioned this earlier. Instead of don't breathe there, our directive would be uh, pull through the breath or pull the, the phrase over the bar line. So that instead of a don't and then a verb, I'm just giving them a verb so that there's no qualitative, there's no um, judgment in what they're doing. I'm just giving them another do. All right, so that's language in rehearsal. Now let's talk about our five word directive. This is a, um, an idea that I came up with about eight years ago and it's worked really, really well. And so there's a process to it. And so here is the process. First of all, why do we use so few words? Why am I asking you to only speak five words when we stop the choir? Because you have three to five seconds before you lose them. So you can speak effectively five words in those three to five seconds and get the music going again and maintain the engagement of your students. Okay, so 
when we use these few words, we maintain the focus of the musicians, we maximize their actual doing time as opposed to them listening to rah, 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 rah. Um, and it allows us to trust the ensemble because we're just reminding them of what they already know. And it trains the musicians to be fully engaged in the music for a shorter amount of time. It's interval training for musicians. And of course, because you're spending more time doing, you have fewer discipline issues in the actual rehearsal. All right. So there are times when we do need more words in the rehearsal. And so some ideas of when we need more words or when we're discussing the piece, when we're discussing the text, what does it mean? What do you think the composer's intention was here? Um, when we're discovering the music and its layers, why do you think the composer wrote polyphonic music for the tenors and basses and homophonic music for the sopranos and altos? Um, when we're learning the style or history, when we're learning a concept that we are applying to the music. So in order to derive your five word directive, you have to be thinking on your feet. Bam, 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 fast, fast, fast. So we've already talked about diagnosis and correction and what that process looks like. So you're hearing something, you know how, what you want to hear, you come up with the corrective how, what you're going to teach. And then the next step in the five word directive is to come up with your short verbal phrases that are directives or reminders of what the students have already been taught by you in terms of how to do something. So here is the process. You identify what you are seeking in the rehearsal. I want to hear taller vowels. You teach the concept. What is a taller vowel? How do you create a tall vowel? What do you feel in your body? How do we engage the body to show ourselves what to do for a tall vowel, for example? Then you go back and you identify the key concepts that you just taught. So choir, what does it mean to have a tall vowel? Space in your face, good. It means this. It means breath energy going forward. It means et cetera, et cetera. So that the students are reminding themselves of what you just taught them in the concept. And then the final part of the process of the five word directive is to derive three to five words as a reminder to what you just taught them, reminding them of the key ideas that they just identified for themselves. All right. So here's an example. This is step one, the goal. I would like a better sense of musical line that does not drag in tempo, okay? So this is the concept that I will choose to teach that hopefully will um, make this a little bit better. So the concept, I will choose to teach speaking text in rhythm as a tool in a three-step process. So this is how I would teach speaking text in rhythm. First, Speak in your singing voice. Second, be rhythmically accurate in your speaking. And then finally, speak with correct dynamic and articulation. Those are the three goals. Now, how do we actually practice that? So we speak in rhythm, and these are the key concepts that we would identify together. Keep the breath flowing through the active diction, popcorn diction. Keep the direction in the long notes and shape the phrase dynamically at the end and maintain the active sense of pulse. So then my three to five word directives might be speak text in rhythm. And hopefully they're reminding themselves, speak rhythmically accurate, speak in my singing voice, speak with dynamic and articulation. Hopefully that's triggering that response. Another one would be active diction, please, reminding them of the rhythmic accuracy of their speaking. Speak higher in your singing voice or simply speak in your, speak in your singing voice. I might say more snap to the rhythm or 
asking them as a, as a way that they can answer in their singing, where is the goal of the phrase? So we don't discuss it. We just, I ask them, where is the goal of the phrase? And then we go and they answer me with their actual music making. So in essence, speak like a robot, speak like a robot. The fewer words you can use with fewer judgment, just fact, the better off you're going to be. So that's speaking or deriving your five word directives from your diagnosis and correction process. Two further concepts I would like to uh, delve into today, very short here, um, demonstration. So demonstration in rehearsal is the quickest way to teach. Why? Because it uses mirror neurons. When I demonstrate something to you, your instinct is to parrot it back because we're human beings and we learn by listening and watching. Mirror neurons tell us how to do something when we're observing it in another person. It's the quickest way to get what you want. With this caveat that you must be able to demonstrate exactly what you want to hear. If you demonstrate something else, your choir will parrot it back to you exactly how you have just demonstrated it. So if you don't feel comfortable demonstrating, this is a skill you must develop in your musicianship. You don't have to be able to demonstrate everything, but if you choose to demonstrate in your rehearsal, you must do it exactly the way you want to hear it. Another concept is the silent rehearsal. And this goes along with the idea of five word directives, except you're just not going to speak. <laughs> so silent rehearsal is based in doing rather than listening to words. So the more engagement you have from your singers, the more they are learning. Your facial expression is your greatest tool in your silent rehearsal. When, and again, it goes back to mirror neurons. When we're watching this, instead of listening to bah, 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 this engages a new and deeper level of learning. And so it engages the attention of our students in a deeper way. So you can use this technique, um, maybe not for the whole rehearsal, but if you feel the energy kind of going in different directions than the room, just be silent. Great. So they tried it. I didn't like it. I gave them some feedback. They tried it again and it was good. So ways that you can incorporate fewer words into your rehearsal will make you a more effective and efficient rehearsal technician. So please let me know if you have any questions and happy rehearsing. Bye.